Welcome to the Why Did I Get Cancer podcast. I'm Deborah Herlax Enos, a small town girl turned TV nutritionist and healthy living expert. I design health programs for the average guy or gal, including those average guys named Metallica. On September 1st, 2020, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I asked every oncologist the same question, why did I get cancer? But none of my doctors had good answers for me. I wanted answers and that's why I started this podcast. I wanna help you to lower your cancer risk and provide self-care tips for those in the battle. I'm getting answers and I wanna share them with you. I had so many great takeaways with my conversation today with Liz Curran from the Radical Remission Project. One of the conversations that I loved so much was we had one about laughter, and she was saying that there was a really interesting study, and um, two groups of people going through chemo. One group got funny movies or sitcoms or jokes. They got to watch and listen, and they were laughing a lot. The other group going through chemo, maybe they just brought their laptops and they were working, or they just brought a book to read. At the end, they tested both groups and they discovered that the group that was laughing, the chemo was more effective and they recovered quicker from the chemo. So listen to today's podcast, find out about all the 10 healing factors with radical remission, but specifically the one about laughter and how it can really heal your body. Welcome, Liz Curran, to Why Did I Get Cancer? I've been so looking forward to our conversation. Because I had Dr. Kelly Turner on about a year ago, and that was one of my most downloaded podcasts. And you are the co-director of the Radical Remission Project. Can you tell us yes, more about exactly. what that is? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, well, it was probably about when you interviewed her that she decided that she was going to follow her strong reasons for living, which is one of mm. our healing factors, and kind of take her life in the direction of screenwriting, which oh, is one of her boy. passions. So with that, she needed someone to kind of keep the work going at the Radical Remission Project. So my business partner, I have a private practice for health coaching cancer patients called the Health Navigators. And my business partner is Carla mans And the two of us together are also the co-directors of the Radical Remission Project. So we um, just kind of handle the day to day. We run our podcast and teach workshops and training mm -hmm. for the other coaches and different things like that. Well, radical remission. I think I first heard about it maybe on the on the Doctor Oz show. I think Doctor Turner was on. Mm -hmm. And radical remission. I mean, I love hearing remission stories. But can you tell us a little bit what? How does the word radical work with remission? What does that mean? Yes. So when she first was kind of coming up with the idea or the concept for her PhD many years ago, she wanted to study spontaneous remission cancer patients to see how they healed and what they did because nobody was studying them. And she really felt like that was a missed opportunity in general. And, and she just wanted to know. So she decided to get her PhD and that would be her thesis would to be to do this research. So as she did the research, she found um, and we can certainly discuss those uh, 10 healing factors that came up in the research. Over time, she has researched over 1,500 cases of spontaneous remission and found these 10 healing factors were used by all of those people. And so what she found was these are not spontaneous remissions. They are radical because these people do a mm. lot of things to promote their healing. Okay. So I love that, the difference between spontaneous and radical, because radical to me, would I would think, yeah, you. I mean, you really are getting after it. You're really getting after something. Right. Whereas spontaneous might yeah. be something that you know just happens overnight, I guess. But radical, you know, to right. me denotes work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was almost a disservice to those people by calling it spontaneous because it mm -hmm. it wasn't like that, right? It was slow, steady lifestyle changes that promoted their mm -hmm. wellness after they were sent home from the hospital with no more ability to um, have conventional care or they chose not to mm -hmm. use it at all and still went into remission. Okay. So then would, would you say that most of these 1,500 cases that you're talking about, these are people who basically were sent home to die? Essentially, yes. Wow. And if you'd like, I can define what a radical love, remission I'd is. I'd love that. Yes. Honor. Great. So there's three, category, three categories. First one is someone who heals without treatment at all. 
So they've gotten a diagnosis and they do lifestyle change regardless of stage and they find remission through Mm -hmm. alternative methods. And that has that's a a wide variety of things, a big Mm -hmm. spectrum of things. The second one are is uh, people who have done conventional medicine, but then it stops working or they choose not to continue and they still find remission outside Mm -hmm. of treatment. And then the third category is people who have used utilized both. They've done the conventional, they've done all the lifestyle changes, they've done alternative things, an integrative approach, if you will. And those people, the category is that they had a 25% or less chance of a five-year survival rate and have outlasted that. So that is kind of most of the work Mm -hmm. that we do um, as coaches. We're working with people kind of in that integrative approach And the Radical Remission Project, certainly not against conventional medicine at all. It was just that the research initially was done on people who had healed without it. And probably people who also had tried conventional and then conventional said, hey, there's nothing else we can do. Get your affairs in order, I'm assuming. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Wow. Yep. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's bold to, to research these people. Because mm-hmm. I have been accused in my career to be of being woo woo, uh, and I'm <laughs> I'm assuming you have too with this radical remission project that yeah. it can be a little woo woo, it can be a little pie in the sky, you know, all of those things. But when we when we look at the ten healing factors, it's things like change your diet a little bit or change your diet a lot. Probably, can you tell us maybe your most surprising? Sure. Of the 10 healing factors, what took you by surprise? Well, I think what often surprises people in general with these factors is that out of the 10, only three are physical. So the rest are, seven of them are emotional, spiritual, or uh, Mm -hmm. mental. So we like to focus on that because that feels really, I mean, first of all, that work is essentially free. Yeah, it sure is. (laughs) Um, that that is not something you're going to spend thousands upon thousands of dollars on. And they're very accessible. Uh, for some people, some are more difficult than others. And that's why, you know, we exist as coaches to kind of support people to utilize these factors. But I'll just list them if that. you'd like yeah. just for your audience to hear them. So the three physical, not hugely surprising diet. We call exercise and movement because as you can imagine, movement is very differently perceived than exercise. And in the initial book, Radical Remission, which I'll show them what it looks like here, this is Radical Remission. Exercise and movement was not in there. That book is based on nine Mm. healing factors. But when she went back to look at the research, she realized that people weren't thinking about exercise when they came home from hospice, but they were moving. And they started to move a little more and a little more. It went from, you know, being bedridden to being able to sit up and then maybe walking to the restroom or walking around the dining room table. So slow little micro movements that later became, you know, right. everyday movements. Um, so then the second book, Radical mm-hmm. Hope, came out in 2020. Yep, I'm going to hold that up you. a little longer. And that one came out in 2020 and added that 10th factor of exercise and movement. Um, and the rest were all... Um, we're all mm-hmm. still there. She had added some more research and some updated uh, scientific research in the book itself. So the other um, physical factor is taking uh, herbs and supplements that are prescribed by a licensed mm-hmm. practitioner. So this is the one factor that we really recommend is handled by a licensed practitioner. So they're testing you specifically, your blood, your urine, your saliva, whatever they want to test. Um, they're testing your specific metrics and prescribing accordingly. And that's it for physical. There's a lot of things that fall under the um, immune supportive alternative medicine, and we kind of bundle them into that herbs and supplements okay. factor. So when it comes to the uh, the other ones, um, there's a lot of kind of surprises, I think, for anyone that this information is new to. So I'll start with releasing suppressed mm-hmm. emotions. That one yeah. is probably the one that most people yeah. focus on. So stress falls in that category, trauma falls in that category, and nostalgia actually falls in that category. Wow. What do you mean by nostalgia? So we talk about releasing suppressed emotions. Notice it's not releasing negative emotions. 
It's Mm. emotions that are stuck in our bodies. So a lot of times they can be negative emotions like trauma and anger and sadness Mm. and grief, but also things like nostalgia where you're living in the past. You're really like totally focusing on a part of your life that you wish you still lived there. Oh, the good old days. Or I wish, you know, I was thriving my best when I was in my 20s and wishing away your present. And that presents a blockage. Wish, I'm writing this down, Mm -hmm. wishing away your presence, present. Yeah, your present day. You need to live in the now, right? And really find a way to embrace all things about your present, whatever they are, um, to truly have that flow of energy. So that can shut down the flow of energy by just living in the past and and thinking your best is behind you. Basically. Yes, exactly. And and a lot of times with a late stage cancer diagnosis, people can go there. Oh, they yeah. can, you know, they have a lot to grieve about their pre-diagnosis life that things that they may not have been able to do. Maybe some people lost the ability to have children or didn't mm-hmm. have the relationship they thought they were going to have or the career. So there are a lot of big things that come with a diagnosis that need to be addressed mm-hmm. um, or they will present blockages and stress. And while those things don't cause cancer, they can fuel it. Okay. So those things may not cause cancer, but they are they provide fuel for mm-hmm. the cancer to really take off. Yes. Okay. This, yeah. So is this the one that you found the most surprising or? Actually, I think that one makes the most sense. I think that the stress, yeah, I think the most surprising to me, um, I'll just read them real quick and then I'll go back and see you can correct me. Increasing positive emotions is one we use. That was a little surprising. I wouldn't have expected that to Mm -hmm. have an immune boosting response. Being empowered, talking to your medical team and believing in them and truly feeling that you are the boss of your medical life. Um, That's a really big one. And that was not surprising to me because that was something that I really related to with my past of uh, getting into this work. So I can share more about that in a bit. Having strong reasons for living, having a sense of purpose, that is really a a key one for a lot of people, making sure that they feel that they still have life to live on this planet while they're here Mm -hmm. in their bodies. Um, Increasing social support, making sure you feel really connected and supported by your family, friends, coworkers, whatever that looks like for you. And if you don't have any of those things and you have a pet that loves you unconditionally, sometimes that's enough. Yeah. So there's a lot there um, in that in that realm. The ones I think that are most surprising to me are the last two, deepening your spiritual connection mm. and following your intuition. Oh, two very yeah. interesting ones. So yeah. So why did you find both of those surprising? I think that I didn't see deepening my spiritual connection as um, I didn't have before before learning about this work. I didn't know so much about the mind body connection. Mm -hmm. And now, obviously, I've delved into it deeply. So that spiritual connection really resonated with me because I'll just kind of bring this into the into the scene here. But um, I lost my sister to cancer 10 years ago and my grief and processing of that loss was very spiritual. Mm -hmm. And having that spiritual connection really um, allowed me to move forward and to enter doing this work to support other people on a similar journey. So I found the deep connection between having that, that spiritual practice and my mental health. Okay. And it really allowed me to feel very grounded um, and really kind of develop a new way of thinking that allowed peace back into my life. A new way of thinking that allowed peace back into your life. That um, That's a really big statement. And I don't know who wouldn't want that. <laughs> you know, how do you, yeah. how do you get through something so hard, such as yeah. losing your sister? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, what, what was fascinating to me was, uh, so when she passed, I wasn't working in the health world yet. Uh, mm-hmm. I had a marketing background. Mm. Um, and then I I was just drawn to, someone had mentioned health coaching to me, that they are a health coach. And my whole body was like, what? Wait, I need to know more about that. My, it just yeah, it what lit is up that? and I, yeah. I had to ask. So then I found out what health coaching was and I was like, all right, I think I'm going to do that. So I started pursuing my my certification and 
and building my business. And I founded that around nutrition. And okay. at the same time that I was in my coaching program, a, another friend of mine um, had a very late stage, very aggressive and unusual cancer uh, diagnosis. And she ended up not being treatable, much like some of these other radical remissions, right? She wasn't treatable. So she ended up going to Mexico to find other options. And she learned about this whole other side of cancer, this kind of alternative side to cancer that mm -hmm. I didn't know about. And she came back and was talking and, you know, telling us our, our friend group about it. And, um, and it, it was very eye opening for me personally, because that was not a path that my sister had followed or that our right. family even knew about. And within six months, my friend's cancer was in remission. So really, it was Seek seeking very alternative treatment yes. in another country. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so that was a lesson. And mm -hmm. through that experience, I came to learn about the book, Radical Remission. And when you open the book, the table of contents lists out the factors. And I was at an event and someone handed the book to me and I opened it up and I'm looking and I'm like, oh, thanks. This is cool. And I open it up and I look at the book and I was like, wow, these 10 things. And I immediately, my first response was, this is what I did to get over my grief and not really kind of get over. You can never really get over grief, but to really heal from a lot of the wounds that came from that experience. Mm -hmm. And so I say these factors are for everyone. Yeah. No Especially, matter what you're going through. Yeah. 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 So the mental health mm -hmm. stuff for sure, the physical health stuff for sure, mm -hmm. um, pairing the, the mind and the body and the spirit connection really is, um, that true holistic approach, right? So right. looking across all the whole, the whole bit. Right. Because we're not just, you know, one dimensional. I mean, we have so much, we're all so different. We need a kind of a customized program and honestly kind of going back to our, our roots, you know, I don't know mm -hmm. that necessarily living in the modern world has been so great for all of us. You know, when you talk about spiritual right. health or, stress, you know, we're, we're on these phones, you know, glued to them all day long and technology. And, you know, it's nice to just kind of get back to the basics, which mm -hmm. these healing factors, that's, they seem like you're just getting back to your original operating system. Right. And people really resonate with them because they, it, it makes sense. I mean, who mm -hmm. doesn't want to increase their positive emotions? Everyone knows right. that that will counteract kind of a bad day, if someone makes you laugh, you can kind of get out of that funk. Or yeah. if you've had a bad meeting at work and you walk around the block and kind of get some fresh air and some sun on your face or, or you know, see your pets and, and have a little, you know, spend a little time cuddling them before the next meeting, you feel very different as opposed to the grind of back different. to back to back, you know, yeah. um, in that world of, of work. Yeah. So, yeah. That is a really good point. Okay. I, I, uh, yeah, I, I love this. Getting back to basics, mm -hmm. pausing during the day, because yeah. that's also what you're talking about. And do you see people, um, and, and I know that we, we've spoken about no one factor is maybe more important than other factors, mm -hmm. but have you seen people resistant to maybe a couple of the factors and, and which ones are those? I think that, um, well, initially when we meet with people, we ask them, which ones look hardest and which ones look easiest to you, mm, right? Kind of okay, find out just because it, it truly is amazing to see the spectrum of answers. Uh, you know, first person might say, I really need help with the physical stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the next person might say, I really can't find my positive emotions. Mm -hmm. And so while that one is, is an easy one for me, because I'm just an optimist person and um, positivity kind of is where I go or at my route. Um, for some people, they just can't find it. So that one is surprising. One that comes up, I, I will say, you know, probably 99% of the time releasing suppressed emotions is the one that people are like, yeah, I need that one or I need that one, but I don't want to go there yet. And that's a fair, that's a fair comment. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we always say these don't all have to be done at the same time. Oh, you know, well, that is a time. really good point, right? Yep. Because you're talking about people who are exhausted because mm -hmm. they've been through all types of cancer treatment. Yeah. Um, the, the medical world has given up on them. And to look at these 10 factors, I can see that being a little intimidating. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as basic as they sound, they are not easy. I mean, if I were to tell you that you had to become a vegan and start meditating 20 minutes and exercising 20 minutes every single day, in addition to all these other practices, you know, they take time, they take routine. Mm -hmm. So infusing one at a time and really feeling comfortable with it, or, you know, not everybody has to work on all 10. Yeah, um, that's true. So, yeah. you know, some people really like, well, they'll come to us and they'll already have their diet and exercise routine underway. Right. But they need the stress reduction. So, right. um, but yeah, that releasing mm -hmm. suppressed emotions one, I think resonates because it is, it is fairly broad, uh, means something different to everybody. It does. It but does. a lot of times it, it, um, it to me and the work, a lot of times it comes through as childhood trauma that needs to get addressed, in mm -hmm. which case we then refer out to therapists for that to do that work we do not own responsibility for all all things healing with these factors we make sure we have really solid resources to share and and really vetted people to hand them off to in a lot of these factors yeah that makes that makes sense because that's a that's that for some people that can be a very big one to to unpack yes yes absolutely so you mentioned mentioned intuition and mm -hmm. I always, when I talked to Kelly Turner before, I thought that was such a surprising one. But do most of us have a pretty strong intuition, most of the people that you see, and do they already know because of their intuition that they have things to work on? I think a lot of people are feeling disconnected to that. Okay. Um, there are people who are definitely very comfortable using their intuition, and there's a lot of people who are feeling very disconnected. And maybe it's because they just learned about it being um, on that factor list. They don't realize they're connected to it. And mm -hmm. then they just have to start learning to listen to it. And then it becomes much easier. I think as lifestyle change gets adopted and wellness, you know, starts to develop, then following that intuition can feel a lot easier. It is really, I mean, what we say, the intuition is is a body part, right? It's it's uh, an important to connect. It's in our gut and we have to make mm -hmm. sure it's connected with the function and the logic in our brain and that they try to be aligned right. so that when you're walking into a situation, you feel super nervous, but you just plow through up here and you're just like, well, I got I to gotta keep going because I have this scan ahead of me. It's okay to feel anxious and nervous about a scan and having scan anxiety. And it's okay for your brain to tell you to still walk through that door and go, but trying to make sure that you acknowledge that, right? Use that intuition to know that that is an emotion that needs to be addressed right. and that you want to process that um, so that maybe the next time you go for that scan, it isn't quite as scary Yeah. so that you can process the, the fear around it. Mm-hmm. And I'd imagine also that the more supportive people you have around you, the easier this is going to be. Because again, you have that, you have your people. Yeah. 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 And we talk about that not only through the increasing social support factor, but the empowerment factor. Mm -hmm. Because empowerment, it allow, it, it's important for so on so many levels. And we talk a little bit about utilizing that to navigate your medical team, but also... Mm -hmm. Feeling empowered with your social support system, your friends, your parents, your siblings, your children, what do they think about your medical situation? Everybody's got an opinion. They should. Right? Everybody has something to say. Right. They do or don't agree with it. Um, and some people can't even, so much so that they can't even have a relationship with you, which is hmm. such a, a shame that that is what happens. But there are people who can't. Uh, they can't sit back and watch someone do a different treatment than they would do for themselves. So that empowerment need to be strong and not let that pressure you into making decisions that other people want for you, but letting that intuition guide you. Um, so increasing that social support, that factor really revolves around making sure that you are surrounding yourself with people who will support your decisions and not try mm -hmm. to guide them for you. Well, that is a really interesting point. Hey, you guys, I want to talk to you about a product called WaveBlock. Here's the deal. Technology is not going away. We carry our phones on our bodies, which trust me, you should never do. In fact, it even says in the small print on the phone, never let the phone touch your body. Don't put it in your back pocket. But also the same thing goes with um, earbuds or earbuds or 
you know, headphones is that you really do need to be careful because when you have one in each ear, it's basically a modem. Where does the modem meet? Right in the middle of your head, also known as your brain. That's the last thing I want to do is have more radiation in my body, especially my head. So, so I discovered this product probably two years ago and it's called WaveBlock. It's a little wrap that actually goes around the earbud so that it knocks the radiation down. And, and I've seen some reports from this company that it can knock it down um, almost 90%. I think it's 87%. And you know what? That is good because here's the deal. I still use my earbuds occasionally and technology, again, it's not going away. So we just need to figure out healthy ways to manage technology. And that's really the key here. I want to protect my husband. I want to protect my kids and my nephews. And I want to protect everybody I meet, actually, um, including women I see running on down the street and they have their phone in their bra. And I come up and I say, please stop. Trust me when I say, take that out of your bra or at least put it on airplane mode. Turn the phone off if you can do that. So um, use the code ENOS10 to get 10% off of your WaveLock purchase. Enjoy. I'm a big fan of protein. Yep. <laughs> You've listened to this podcast before. You know I'm a big fan of protein. I grew up on a farm and I had access to great healthy sources of protein that we grew ourselves for the most part. So I want to talk to you today about chicken thighs. I'm a huge fan of chicken thighs. I like chicken breasts too, but there's just not a lot of flavor to them. I love chicken thighs because they have a higher fat content than chicken breast. So for me, what that means is if I have protein with a higher uh, fat content, it keeps me fuller longer. If I stay fuller longer, then that also means I'm not snacking. I work from home, so it is really easy for me to go into the kitchen and be snacking for a good chunk of the afternoon. So if I have a chicken thigh at lunch, it's a fantastic way for me to go. It keeps me fuller longer. Here's the other thing I like about chicken thighs is the serving size is just about perfect for somebody my size. Um, for my husband, he might eat one and a half or maybe even two. But for me, one is enough. It's um, Again, it's a really great size for me. So let me tell you about the ButcherBox deal right now on chicken thighs. It's actually choose your own protein. You could choose chicken thighs, steak tips, or ground beef. But you could get free chicken thighs, three pounds of them in your box every month. And you could do that for an entire year or just do it for a couple of months. Um, use the code ENOS, all lowercase, E-N-O-S. Um, the link is in the show notes to um, go to the ButcherBox um, website and figure out what you're going to put in your first box. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoy these chicken thighs as much as I do. It's probably one of my favorite go-to proteins. You can put them in a crock pot, cast iron skillet, or even put them on the barbecue. Oh, and I just got a black stone. So that's what I'm going to try out this weekend. I'll keep you posted. Enjoy. I'm in the nutrition world and most of it is kind of the alternative, more holistic, um, what your grandparents did, what your grandparents ate. And I... I know that in my own life, you know, people look at me a little crazy when I say, you know, eat organ meats and, you know, right? enjoy your real butter. You know, butter is actually good for you. And the, the things that I talk about, um, you know, people raise a lot of eyebrows, but I've also had enough training in this area to know that this is accurate information. Um, so I can see that people... If you're seeing somebody doing alternative, again, maybe the medical community has let you go and gone home to get your get your affairs in order. Why not? Why not try this next thing? Yeah. And I can well, see. And also yeah. with the integrative approach, that's also that makes some people really uncomfortable. You know, <laughs> family members or friends, they don't agree with spending all that money, all that money on things that aren't covered mm -hmm. by health insurance. And well, that some is of those really things true. are extremely important yes. to with your immune system. Um, yeah, I can, I can see that. Because it's, you know, it's mo uh, many of these items on the 10 healing, f the, the list mm -hmm. aren't going to cost you a lot of money. Right. But there are a few that will 
that will yeah supplements yeah. and different mm-hmm. things like that mm-hmm. changing your diet although there are ways around you know spending a lot of money on food by mm-hmm. shopping in bulk and going to your farmers markets and things like that yeah yeah yep. yeah okay okay so you'd mentioned earlier um about your sister mm-hmm. can you tell us a little bit about what drew you into working with the cancer community in yes. regards to your sister? Yeah, absolutely. So she um, had a very conventional treatment path. It was a very rare, very aggressive cancer. It's mm-hmm. like 1% of breast cancers uh, were in this category. And so she was diagnosed and passed within a year. Ugh. And so it was a fairly quick cancer journey, uh, all from you know start to finish. And one thing that was very much in her personality was she was the um, the good patient. We, we call them in radical remission, the mm-hmm. oh, kind of obedient, do whatever they say and mm-hmm. don't ask questions kind of thing. Um, I was in appointments where she would try to ask some questions and they would say, oh, no, we're not going to talk about that yet. Let's wait till further down before we know. And you know, at the time I, I was like, okay, well, that's what the doctor says. Let's, let's do that. And she, she was very compliant is a good word. Yeah. Um, but what I did see it do was it took hope away from her because if you mm. tell her the answer to her question about what she's thinking may happen in six months, then she can hold on to that. And even if it changes, you know, it's not set in stone, things can change, but um, she didn't have anything to hold on to. So it, it really restricted her perspective on getting second opinions and kind of looking into supplementation or different opportunities that she had um, because they were not, quote, allowed. So when I learned about that being healing factor, I was like, yes, this is so important. People really need to feel like they have questions that need to be answered and they deserve to be answered. So that really kind of oddly enough, that factor was the one that kind of really propelled me to, I want to make sure everyone knows about these factors. I want to make sure people feel um, that they're accessible. And so then I shifted my coaching practice from nutrition to cancer and took the radical remission teacher training at the time and, um, and just dove right in to that. It was like, such a natural fit. I just, I, I look back and I think, how did I not see that? Right, right. But it took being in those appointments with your sister and then somebody handing you the book that yep. probably just connected all of the dots. Yes. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, sitting there and hearing what I call the white coat. I have a lot of respect for the white coat. I mm-hmm. do. Absolutely. I have a lot of respect. Um, but what I don't love is shutting a patient down yeah. when they're asking questions. And that goes with you know, so many situations in life. But we don't really push back. A lot of people don't push back. And it sounds like maybe your sister yeah. just, just accepted. Mm-hmm. accepted yeah. I, well, yeah. she fully trusted. She was in right. phenomenal hands. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I don't think that they did anything that they should not have. I mm-hmm. 100% believe in the path that she took was one she believed in and that they did what they truly thought. And I can't ever say with her very rare, very aggressive cancer, right. that the outcome would have been any different. I can't right. know that. You don't know. So I do have a lot of peace in that because I have to, right? We didn't know. There you just was You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And now so it has you on this path. That education right, right. has yes. you on this would path. Right. I, did I wish I wouldn't have known it differently then? Yes, of course. But I didn't. And so I, I am not holding on to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I can do is help other people through these kind of interviews and having our podcast and making sure people know about the book. And, you know, I have a very, very close friend who just got a diagnosis. So I get a a second chance now to Mm -hmm. um, just share, right. And sharing the information and let people decide what they do and don't want to take. And that's, that's the, the most important thing is being respectful of that. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I agree with that. I, I also um, I also really agree with asking questions. And if your healthcare team, be it a chiropractor, acupuncturist, or an oncologist, if they don't pause, you know, really look you in the eye and answer your question, it might be time 
yeah. to get a second opinion. And I'm I love second opinions anyway, but I I had an experience last week just with a dental appointment. I had a teeny tiny little chip that came off of a filling. I was traveling. I went to um, a dentist. I and when I called, they said, "When's when was your last CAT scan?" And I said, well, "I've never had a CAT scan. I I've never had a head injury." And they said, "Well, the doctor really likes you know to do CAT scans, and I guess it's a dental CAT scan." And I said, "Well, I'm like two years out of cancer. I've had so much radiation." I'm trying to reduce how much radiation right. I get. And, you know, I don't think you need a CAT scan. I'm not a dentist, but I don't think I need a CAT scan to get a little, you know, repair on a tooth. Anyway, so I let them know I didn't want to do it, got there, let them know I, again, wasn't going to do a CAT scan. And then the dentist went on to ask me six times during the appointment and really shaming me. She said, 99% of my patients get CAT scans with me. And I said, you know, I guess, I guess I'm the 1%. And I said, you know, thank you so much for your time, but I think this just isn't the practice for me. And Perfect. yeah. And so I felt like I took my power back because I, I really yes. felt like I was getting bullied into a treatment that my intuition said, honey, you don't need this CAT scan. And then I found a different dentist a couple of days later and I told her what happened. And she's like, oh my gosh. I have right. never heard of anybody getting a CAT scan right. for a little chip, I. a little chip on a filling. And yeah. she said, yeah, we might do that for a root canal or a dental implant. But anyway, yeah. so I guess Perfect that example. That, that to say, just listen, you know, listening to your intuition is one of the 10 healing factors. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the more we listen to our intuition, the more we hear from our intuition. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that's a perfect example of the pressure that, you know, that six times you had to say no. Right. And that's, that's not serving anyone. It's not serving her. It's not serving you. Good for you for realizing that that and having the courage to say, you yeah. know, a lot of people might have just left the practice and, and never gone back. But you took the time to say, this isn't the practice for me to her. And now she knows that. No, so she maybe knows. she'll have a different approach. Yeah. I mean, it's, I can't yeah. tell you how many times, you know, I, I talk to clients, they they either have a great relationship with their oncologist or a not so great one. And interesting. You know, so when they don't have a great experience, my my you know, guidance would be to have a second opinion from a non naturopathic oncologist so mm -hmm. that you're getting a second opinion from someone from a different perspective. And you know, certainly you can shop around for oncologists. Um, and if you don't like the ones that you have, there might be a better fit personality wise. Uh, but a lot of times people want the best one for their diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And if they aren't a fit personality wise, they still need to go and have that perseverance. Like you, you know, you've had mm -hmm. to continue to say no. And they, it takes a lot of strength from within. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times, those relationships evolve to they show up and they don't tell them everything that's going on because yeah. they don't want to hear the lecture or the judgment in the tone of voice from the practitioner. I, so, I um, know. you know, it's a disservice to both the practitioner and the patient that the relationship can't be more honest. Yeah, it is. It's a disservice to both. And I think it's just demoralizing to both. And I think as the, from the patient side, um, I can say that when I was shut down, by somebody on my oncology team, I got really mad. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I had no control over my health. And I'd already felt like my body was betraying me. <laughs> and so that just piled more on. And um, that that's not good for my healing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that changes your perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's hard to look at what your sister went through as a blessing to you. Ugh, I hate to even say that, but. Um, well, there, you know, and I, I, it, I find it, there's a lot of comparison to losing, you know, I call them big losses, having a big loss mm -hmm. and having a late stage cancer diagnosis. There are a lot of parallels uh, from an emotional perspective. Right. And, you know, there's a lot of loss that occurs with a diagnosis as well. So, I always try to find the silver linings to what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have very beautiful family. Her her children are 
amazing and her husband is wonderful and we still have great relationships because we support each other through right. all of that. But I think it is um, it is worth making note of of the parallels between those two and and noting that um, they can be fairly challenging, uh, equally challenging to find the silver linings. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you what, most of my clients can find silver linings every single day in something. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of gratitude that comes with that later stage diagnosis. Once you're over the fear, mm -hmm. um, you see life through a different lens. And there's a lot of beauty that can be found that maybe never would have been seen had the diagnosis not come. I, I, and I can't agree with you more um, because I really feel like cancer, in my case, I'll say that, was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. But I also, you know, am very aware that I have a lot of friends who are no longer on the planet because they had cancer. Right. So everybody's different, you know, experience is so different. But for me, um, I got an opportunity to remake my life. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I really love my new life. But I also remember when I got my diagnosis, texting girlfriends and my friend Kathy coming over saying, your life, because she'd already been through it, breast mm -hmm. cancer. And she said, let me tell you how your life is going to change. And I said, I don't want my life to change. I love my life. I don't want my life yep. to change. And I still, that's still just kind of brings me to tears whenever I think about it um, because your life does change, but it doesn't have to be bad. Right. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think, I think most people can, un can relate to adversity bringing change that mm -hmm. may have silver linings. Yeah. Um, if you, if you are the kind of person that can see that. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. And I'm, I'm guessing um, I call it, um, you know, Eeyore, um, <laughs> you know, are you Eeyore? <laughs> and if you are Eeyore, how do you, how do you find the silver lining? Yeah, I think that a gratitude practice really helps. Um, maybe it's not a daily one, but it's the, it, you know, just a, a gratitude conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, what is something that you can find gratitude for in your day today, right yeah. now, you know, and then Usually people can find something mm -hmm. and then that can be kind of the beginning of a conversation around that topic. And some people find gratitude practices life-changing. Mm -hmm. One of my pot. Up. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not as consistent with it as far as writing it down, but I, I say things aloud because I think it's also really important. I feel like I'm coaching myself during the day. If I say, Oh, I'm so grateful for coffee. I'm so grateful that I can smell the coffee. I'm clearly very much a coffee person living in <laughs> Seattle. But um, also, you know, I love that I can, I can hear the birds. And I just, I just basically kind of prophesy over myself first thing in the morning. And I find if I do that, my day completely shifts into mm -hmm. such a more – I see everything with my rose-colored glasses, which I like my rose-colored glasses. I'm a realist, but I also prefer to yeah. see the good – and the yeah. light and the grace and the mercy and, you know, in the people that I run into. And that's how my gratitude practice has changed post-cancer. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it doesn't have to be a written thing. Not everybody's a journaler, right? But what you're describing is a gratitude meditation, essentially. You're very present. You're in the moment. Okay. You're loving your coffee. I'm loving my coffee. <laughs> Gosh darn it. Sharing that appreciation. <laughs> and what that does, it activates part of your the part of your brain that, puts out, we call it our internal pharmacy or our happy hormones, mm. um, the oxytocin, the endorphins, like just maybe for you, the smell and like, oh, I love my coffee. That's enough to activate that. And those are immune mm. boosters and they clean out natural killer. They're like they boost the natural killer cells that help clean out the cancer cells. So okay. endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, all of those things. So we want to activate that as much as we can. And that's what these healing factors do. They all boost your immune system. Okay, so so thinking happy thoughts and being grateful that actually that actually turns on mm -hmm. your natural killer cells that can kill cells that have gone rogue. 
Absolutely. That are becoming yep. There's cancer. a lot of research, actually. Some of the interesting research we share in, it's in, in the books and in the workshops that we do about people who have, um, so there's a study, for example, uh, one group, you know, the control group does their thing and the other group is shown comedy during chemotherapy sessions. And what they find in the blood work is, you know, you can't even compare the two. They're, they're, it's more effective. They have less side effects over a long term. And it's, it's even after four hours after their, their chemotherapy session. So it's oh pretty my remarkable. Gosh, mm -hmm. that's incredible research. So because yeah. the people who were getting chemo, they were watching a comedy show at the time. Mm -hmm. And yep. so the chemo was more effective. Mm -hmm. Because they were feeling because laughter and joy and just ease. Oh As opposed goodness. to maybe somebody who brought their laptop from work and they're doing their job or they're they're just so nervous about the infusion or, you know, who knows. But they were not they were not distracted. They did whatever they wanted to do. And this other group was given funny videos to watch. So. Oh, my gosh, that is a lot. That is amazing. That value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's that the kind of research you'll find in that book, the Radical Remission and Radical Hope books. Mm -hmm. It's all research about things that are very relatable. And I mean, the the intuition research is phenomenal. There's so many really cool things that um, if you don't take the time to know about it, you don't mm -hmm. realize the value. Wow. And I, I love to laugh. And but there are days, you know, I find that, gosh, I haven't laughed today. Mm -hmm. And so then maybe I'll go watch Seinfeld, which always makes me chuckle or The Office or whatever it is. Yeah. Or yeah. just call a funny friend. Yes. Or, you know, read a dad joke, you know, but I, <laughs> I really, I really try to get in a lot of laughter each day. And I remember reading this statistic years ago about that children under the age of, I don't know, 10, I'll just throw that out there, laugh about 300 times a day and adults laugh less than 10. Oh my gosh. And I thought, oh my goodness gracious. I don't, I want to be a child. <laughs> Yeah. And that childlike uh, right. wonder, right? right. I, I bet that's right. spot on. Yeah. Right. And so if laughing more and finding more joy in situations turns on my natural killer cells so that it reduces me ever getting a recurrence of cancer, I'm yeah. going to figure out some ways to laugh even more today than I already do. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And we talk about that being a muscle that needs to be exercised, right? So if you're not someone that easily finds joy or gratitude in your coffee or whatever mm -hmm. it is, um, starting with starting small with five minutes a day of, of an intentional practice, whether that is a gratitude journal or calling a friend that's going to make you laugh or turning on a show that makes you crack up. Those things need to occur so that you can jumpstart that and doing a little bit more each day and having that as a practice, if that's not something that's natural for you, mm -hmm. it's important. I think that's, that would, that seems like you know me looking from the outside looking into radical remission and the the second book radical hope that seems like a really great and easy place to start mm -hmm. is yeah. what can you do today to find more joy can you laugh 5 times today or just throw out a number and can you be grateful for one thing yeah there's all kinds of um apps too if that's something that you Ooh. know if you you know there's um I think there's an app called Three Good Things, and that's a gratitude one where you just mm. it prompts you, reminds you, hey, don't forget to put your three good things. And then it allows you to share it. So if one of my gratitudes was I was so excited about being on, you know, the podcast today for you, mm -hmm. um, I could send it to you and say, hey, you know, just you made my gratitude list. And then that also oh. virtual support and a little hit that I get to make you feel good, you know, that kind of thing. So th and then the person effect. receiving it is probably yeah. just, you know, it just makes their day. Yeah. It's like a little, you know, I don't know when it's not even an email or a text necessarily. It's just a message that you get that, right. that shares that you've made somebody's day. Um, so mm -hmm. that's one. And then there's another one. There's all kinds of joke ones. Okay. You know, if you like dad jokes, there's probably a dad joke app, but one right. of the, um, the stories in radical remission is about this woman who started the um, organization comedy cures because she found comedy to be her most mm -hmm. healing factor and she has a, I think it's comedycuresfoundation.org or comedycures.org. I can't remember the exact website, but every single day on uh, her phone, the phone number for it is 1-888-ha-ha-ha-ha. And oh. you can hear jokes live, uh, not live, but recorded jokes, recorded one, jokes, one joke a day, and then some live comedy that plays on 
a loop if you want to hear some comedy. So, oh, you know, there's I, all kinds of resources out there. Okay, Liz, I had no idea there were resources like this. So, <laughs> so I'm going to get all these, all these from you. I'll tag them in the show notes because, yeah. you know, you may be feeling great today and, you know, you don't have anything going on in your body, which is such an incredible blessing. But hey, let's keep it that way mm-hmm. by just finding more joy throughout your day, more gratitude. And, you know, the world can be a dark place yes. and we can go down lots of rabbit holes, which I'm just not going to do today. But what, what I try to do every day is say, God, how can I be generous today and how can I be kind? Mm-hmm. Just direct me. And so I, I love the idea of saying, oh my God, you know, in my, the, the, you were the talking app. about the app on the gratitude yeah. and then sending it to somebody and say, Hey, just want to let you know, you were a bright spot in my day to day. Talk yeah. about spreading love and kindness. Exactly. Yeah. And then they're going to maybe do the same. Right. Maybe they'll be like, Oh, what's this cool app? And they'll send it to somebody or, you know, right. Or just say something nice to the next person they see who knows. Yeah. And you that's know, how we, more- that's how we change our communities. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that these factors, you know, as simple as they seem and and more accessible if you're in a place where you're not living with a diagnosis. So people who are post treatment and in remission and want to stay that way, yeah, great to pick these pick these up. I am what we call a previvor, so <laughs> lots of family history of cancer in my family. Mm-hmm. I utilize these factors to stay that way, you know, cancer free, oh. um, and that's something that I. I like the work that I do because it keeps them all top of mind for me every single day. Oh, I love that. Previvor. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So if that's our focus is I want to be as well and as healthy as I possibly can every day, practicing these 10 factors can really help get you there and keep you there. Absolutely. Everyone. Yep. Everyone. Yeah. Whether diagnosis or not. Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, Liz. Oh boy, this was just an amazing podcast. I I feel so encouraged. I mean, you, I I'm a I'm an encourager if you haven't noticed, <laughs> but you encouraged me, and now I feel like there's more tangible evidence and studies and research that just makes me realize that I'm on the right track, and that that's really comforting to me. So thank you. Good. I'm so glad that I was here today to share that with you. Me too. Me too. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, everyone. I just wanted to say a big, huge, humongous fill in the blank. (laughs) Thank you for all your support with this podcast. I was looking at the um, analytics. That's a big word for me. (laughs) And what I discovered is that in the last year, this podcast has grown over 900%. So that's because of you. It has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with you and your support, your reviews, uh, subscribing, all of that helps me go up in the rankings on this podcast. But what it also does is it helps to share it with other people because then somehow, I don't know the details, then other people start to see it because of the rankings. So I just wanted to say just a heartfelt thanks. I love you. I'm going to keep going. Um, This is just such a bright spot in my day to record these podcasts. So thanks for listening. Thank you for joining me today on the Why Did I Get Cancer podcast. I've got my shopping guide for all of my cancer self-care items in the show notes, along with information about today's guest and our show sponsors. And don't forget to subscribe to my podcast so you never miss an episode. Keep in mind, I'm not a doctor. I'm just a gal that got diagnosed with cancer and wanted answers. If you need medical advice, please be sure to consult with a medical professional. And thank you for listening. 